Thank you all for coming to this artist talk uh, with Sinesa Kukaik and Diana Naomi. Um, this is a really exciting uh, time or moment for us because Sinesa has been working um, for a while on this exhibition and uh, Love Like the Universe. And uh, we are happy to, to share this with you. Uh, we've met well, I found out about Sinis' work through the Hollywood Art and Culture Center um, via Jane Hart, uh, who's a good friend of mine, and when I saw his exhibition, um, I just wanted to know who this artist was. I thought it was some of the most exciting work I've seen in Florida in a, in a very long time. So uh, we kept on missing each other, uh, and one day he showed up at a critique um, at a show called Collectivism, which was at a Cena Woodgate show. And uh, while sitting there and listening and, and just paying attention and observing, I felt that uh, Sinessa and I um, spoke a similar language and I wanted to, to continue working with him and just exploring, collaborating. So uh, this is why I'm excited to be sitting here with you today. And I'm very excited that Diana Nowi uh, was able to be a moderator. Um, the associate curator of the Miami Art Museum, soon to be the Perez Art Museum of Miami, or sorry, Perez Art Museum Miami. And uh, I, I don't want to take up too much time. I know that we want to knock this out. Knock this out. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll leave it to you guys. Again, it's slightly call. different than getting it over with. But really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think um, a good place to start is also at the beginning of I met um, Sinessa about a year ago when I first moved to Miami, and um, my co-curator on a show that Sinessa's in, and the curator at the Miami Art Museum, Renee Morales, said, I think you should really check out Sinessa's work. I think he's in a really good place. He also had seen the Hollywood Art Center show and said, I think his work is really progressing, and things are looking really tight and really strong. And so we did a studio visit many months ago. Kind of, um, I was familiarizing myself with the Miami Art Scene, having just moved here, and also kind of looking around for this exhibition that we were working on, um, artist based in the city. And Sinesa's work, I think, when we went into the studio, just looked really cohesive. And I think for Sinesa, the studio is kind of the natural habitat of the work. If you go in there, it's more and more and more. Many, many works, and kind of all of the garbage and detritus and materials that comprise this practice are kind of everywhere. And so just being in there, I got a incredible sense of the language that you were utilizing and the kind of, um, the way that that had really come together in a very formal and tight way. And I really thought it was a kind of cohesiveness of what you were working on that, that struck us. And of course, the work, as many of us are familiar with it, is incredibly sensual. The surfaces are just kind of gorgeous and, and really beautiful. But there's also a really um, nasty or like dark edge to it. I think we've talked about it as the sinister, yes. And so I think um, this exhibition is a lot of that work, two examples of which I think are in the current show at the Miami Art Museum. And, and I think we can think about downstairs as one body of work, which might reflect that more sinister. Yeah. Side, yeah. And then this upstairs, I think, is a really kind of opened up a lot of new paths for exploration. But I wanted to start by talking about downstairs and how you conceptualize that. I know we had talked about certain formal kind of devices that come out of your background, your formal arts training and certain cultural things like music and certain biographical things like your emotional state, things going on in your life. So if you can just talk maybe a little bit about particular works downstairs or even just that body of work and what kind of goes into forming that. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I'd like to thank everybody here first and foremost. It's nice to see all of your faces. It's wonderful. It uh, calms me a little bit. Um, <clears throat> this work, Love Like the Universe, uh, kind of has a, a, a dark side and a, and a light side. Kind of a, a cosmic psychedelic melodrama, I kind of like to think about it in those terms. It, it kind of stems from or, or, or shoots off of a, a prior body of work which was titled um, Farewell Fountain and also was shown twice, Farewell Fountain and From Void to Void. And that's really new work. And this is much newer work in the sense and I think much more refined and I think a little bit clearer or better in many, many ways. But, uh, that body work stemmed, stemmed ultimately from kind of a, uh, a love lost, and uh, it started all, all of this. There's two pieces in the back here called The Fool and the Fool. You have a chance to go see them. 
it kind of started all of this, where I just kind of, you know, fell in love with somebody, fell in love with somebody. That love uh, was apparently in my head, and um, <laughs> and she moved on, and I had to somehow deal with it. The best way to deal with it was was for me to just ultimately start making work based on what was kind of happening on that interior, and. Um, Being someone that likes to work with their hands, I have to constantly deal with the outside world, you know, which we all do from day to day. But regardless, in terms of my studio practice, I have to be there, I have to be present, I have to be making um, things. So that's really important. And so I you know, got to work and you know, trying to call out to this, 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 this love that like, no longer existed in my life or, or the presence of that being was no longer there. So I had to fill that void. And so these objects started to occur, this language started to kind of develop. Uh, and then, you know, laying one thing next to another, um, seeing things kind of fall and collapse, thinking that they're possibly dead, end, and then realizing that they're not, uh, that they're actually kind of like gifts, if uh, I was willing to pay attention to. So, Fool and the Fool is a real, real fine example of that. And of course, there's another piece that's right behind it, or right next to it, which is called Seduction Never Rest. You start to see that the work is becoming more refined, the language is becoming kind of also broader, where it's not necessarily just talking about my own experience. Now it's kind of like investigating or looking at uh, this thing, of, or this, this, this thing, or as a very good friend of mine uh, pointed out to me just recently, is a love, and what is that? You know, it, it's, it's energy, and that's a great way to kind of just simply define it, um, or, or, or a percept that I might have of it. Um, of course, all of you might have a different point of view of what that might be. Um, so, trudging through, trudging through this, and you know, making mistakes, falling down, getting up, um, this process of just you know making stuff. Um, I've had an opportunity to go to the Anderson Ranch Art Center and really kind of have access to time and uh, materials. Uh, Ten weeks of just solid work, and that was awesome. So that's where, that's where. Um, Farewell Fountain was really kind of um, created, and the language I think became much more poignant, and, uh, which led me to this body of work here. And so this body of work, I think, was kind of just thought over and kind of conceptualized probably for over eight months. I don't really draw much. Um, I don't do sketches. I just kind of think about things a lot. And when I'm in studio, I'll just stare at like a piece of furniture that I found on the street corner. Someone calls me up and says, hey, there's a great desk over on you know, so-and-so street, go pick it up, so I'll do that, and I just kind of lead it into studio so I look at it. So this is kind of like you know, a contemplative exercise that happens quite regularly. Or maybe you'd see even a, a meditative process of just looking and losing myself in this thing and imagining what it could be. And uh, utilizing these, um, or using these uh, ways of working that I've been kind of slowly refining in the past five years. I'm not sure if, if any of you know, but I do come out of the field of ceramics. Um, I went to my graduate school at uh, Alfred University, so hence this kind of desire to want to pour epoxy over everything instead of glaze. I just you know, use epoxy, so um, that's what happens there. Um, I feel like I'm losing myself. I don't know. <laughs> where, where do I need to go again? Oh, downstairs, the dark side, right? Okay, so uh, love like the universe is kind of this kind of what I've been trying to think about it is kind of these inner outer experiences. Uh, love being perhaps an inner, and the universe obviously being something outside of yourself. And how do they work together? How do they sit together? And how do we as humans perceive it? And um, I'll be straight up. I'm an atheist, so I don't really believe in God. So that language often. Um, kind of confuses me, and so therefore I try to remove it from my dialogue, and I try to remove it from the work. And um, a lot of the stuff that you have downstairs, I think, is this kind of like battle between these these words that I hear a lot uh, throughout my day, and trying to kind of exercise or remove them um, if, through my kind of conscious being. I'm not exactly sure. So there's always this, this kind of sinister, this kind of kind of dark side. To me, and also uh, my collaborator, who is uh, Aisha Rose Servitus. Some of you might know who she is via Facebook. She's uh, she's allowed me to be uh, her conduit of sorts, um, which has been an amazing experience. I, I met her in uh, 2008 in Croatia via another painter friend of mine, Hervoy, and uh, he introduced me to her. We kind of hit it off, and uh, just. 
uh, oddly enough, she would send me emails of some of her writings, and I thought it was odd because she's a Luddite and she hates technology, but um, apparently I'm, I'm fortunate enough to receive some of these emails every now and again from her. And so I thought it would be really nice if I could share them with Miami and whoever else is like listening um, out there in the world. And so now it's kind of developed itself into this book. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, maybe like back up a little bit and talk about language maybe in earlier work and then as well because I think this show is a culmination of the kind of the way language circulates in your practice. You have like very particular titles, very long, very, very poetic long. Yeah. titles. Yeah. And often there's text in, in the work itself. And, sure. and this seems kind of like an even larger kind of exploration of that impulse. I mean, I was kind of doing that within my own right, no doubt. I mean, prior to meeting um, Aisha, I think that's one of the reasons why we kind of hit it off and decided to collaborate. I mean, I was kind of exploring that, that, um, <coughs> that, um, medium or, 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 or um, platform, which is Facebook, social media, I found it very interesting to, to, to be able to kind of type in these kind of simple phrases or words, which, by the way, um, this kind of double space typing that happens when I, when I do it um, on Facebook was uh, inspired via Kevin Arrow. He was the first one I saw do and then I just totally ripped them off and I've been running with it ever since. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and whenever I see other people doing it now, I get kind of frustrated and angry at them that they're doing that. It's not yours, it belongs to me. But uh, regardless, that's kind of, I mean, I was already doing it prior to meeting Aisha and then kind of going there, but she just kind of made it kind of more valid somehow or, or you know, a deeper connection somehow. And she's a, she, she's a, a, she's a misanthrope. She's an atheist as well. She's, a, as I said, a light. A loner doesn't really kind of get along with others and has a very strong opinion of the world and the people that are in it. And I often agree with her, um, though I don't think I'm quite as, as vicious as she can be sometimes. So she's a kind of sinister. Yeah, I think so. So maybe that's that's it's about about heavy Aisha happening downstairs. Yeah. And then up here, I think, is something really wonderful and new. But in a way, really kind of not because. When I think of these pieces here, these kind of pushed canvases, uh, what's really wonderful happening there is um, while working with the process of ceramics, I was very interested and engaged in uh, mold making. I'm not sure if a lot of you are familiar with the process, but you know, you, you find an object and then you kind of isolate it or encase it in plaster or rubber, rubber what have you, and you, you know, pull it apart and fill the void and then you can make multiples. And I was always fascinated with that emptiness, that that shape that wasn't there, that interior space of the mold. And um, for years, I was kind of thinking, you know, how can I get there? And uh, instead of just, I was doing them with plaster, but I still found it that that was just too close to the, to the real McCoy, so to speak. So this came along. Um, I started doing these kind of poor gravity painting pieces downstairs. There's a lot of gravity being utilized, obviously. So um, someone had mentioned to me uh, Morris Lewis, and then I really figured what the hell, just might as well kind of follow that trajectory, which led me to this point of Gravity Well. This piece here is titled Gravity Well, a portrait of uh, Augustina Wright and Anthony Spinello, um, purely because they helped me make this piece. So whenever someone is engaged in making a piece or, or uh, they've inspired it, they become an instant portrait of them. And then you'll find a portrait of Brandon Opalka in that room. It's called In Pocket, a uh, portrait of Brandon Opalka, which is really wonderful. It's a door that I found in my studio. I can go on and on about it later. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, because I, I see a major shift in the kind of, I mean, it's, it's captured in this notion of sinister and, and then kind of somehow um, skewed upstairs. And I'm just wondering what, what kind of, Opened up that shift. That kind of there's a much lighter touch. There's I think I think that just the I think videos. what happens is with, with me is is uh, my emotions get the best of me for the most part, and I'm easily swayed from one direction or the other. I think what's happening here is um, the community I find here in Miami is really wonderful. Um, at first, when I got here, it was really kind of tough. If I didn't know anybody, and, but the community you know welcomed me. So like, very, it makes me very happy. I guess so. It's really that simple. I think it's just you know, feeling um, feeling very inspired by the people that are around. And a lot of that has to do with um, I have a collaborative called 3PQ with uh, Stefan Turul, who's here, and uh, Freddie Dwyer. Uh, we're the kind of the core 
the core group of that, and uh, we've done a lot of projects. We've worked with Antonio Wright, we've worked with, with uh, Brandon Opelka, and the list goes on and on. Can you talk about, we talked yesterday a little bit about the influence that other people have on your practice. It's key. That. So it's, can you, it's, I think that's something like, I have, you know, we just did this New York Miami show, which was very much about that kind of idea of collaboration, one of the limits, one of the roles, one of the function of that, particularly in the Miami and in this context. So I wonder if you can talk no, about No, absolutely, that. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was just think, I tried to try to think about how to lead up to all that. I mean, it's just, it seems so dense, like a, a five-year period of time. I mean, I'm sure a lot of the other artists that are in this in, in this room right now, I, I think you have a sense of something happening. There's this kind of thing. There's these moments of inspiration. I think we're feeding off a lot of each other. So I think it's a really creative moment. And particularly from my experience, working with 3PQ, having you know studio visits with Renee and you, and, <coughs> and uh, of course meeting Anthony and him opening up you know, so many doors in many ways. Imagine, and then also working with Emmett during the um, the uh, the Man Show, which was interesting. And I heard via the grapevine that he was afraid that I was going to be really the most difficult person to work with. I'd like to think that I was not, um, but it was a great experience, and it was wonderful because I mean I wanted. <laughs> You know, wound up doing something that I would not have done otherwise, like allowing for all that epoxy to spill on the floor. I remember um, Renee and I kind of going at it head to head, and it's like, no, 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 because I wanted to take this piece of wood and put it on underneath the piece to catch it so I can take it home with this me piece later. Really quick is Senesa's process is to pour epoxy, and, and for the work in our show, <coughs> the collaborative kind of process to kind of bring it to life in the space was to take this sculpture in a 90% finished kind of state and finish it in the gallery, which meant pouring this kind of rainbow of epoxy and things down the surface of the sculpture. And so what ended up happening is we had built a podium at Emmett's suggestion out of um, pavers that you find in your driveway and um, you know on the street. And so the epoxy bound Sinessa's piece to the platform. So there's this beautiful puddle of, of liquid, but it Completely speaks to and unveils, I think, your process because sure. you see that liquidity, which I think is really quite interesting. But and it's it's a it's a process that you know happens. I mean, all the kind of the darker pieces downstairs. Um, it's kind of uh, whenever you see these kind of cosmic the cosmic like kind of surfaces. I mean, basically, what you're just seeing is is uh, the lowest point of resistance happening occurring. So there's no mixing of paint. What happens is um, you know. Uh, there's a sculpture that's placed on top of the board, like for example, the speaker piece that's downstairs um, created the um, piece out front illuminations. Um, and what happened there is simply, um, it gets to a certain point where I'm pouring you know, um, gallons and gallons of epoxy and throwing handfuls of, of uh, tempera, which just, I found out recently that there's a, a holiday in, in, in India. And, um, it's today? Yeah, it's, it's like, yeah, it's like yesterday. happening now. Yeah, yeah, it was find, yesterday. Yeah. I find it very interesting because um, I didn't really know much about that holiday, but this um, this one that I thought I was in love with went to India and sent me all these images of her covered in tempera or whatever it was, this pure powder, and she really kind of inspired that. So it's funny how things kind of come back around via uh, relationships and friendships. And I'm sure you all know that, so I'm probably not telling you anything new, but I'm just trying to simply lay out a kiss my journey, which is kind of, it's wonderful when you have these moments of serendipity, that's what I feel, uh, and Miami right now, it's a good time for me, hence, I guess maybe this lighter work that's happening out here, um, does that make it? That makes a lot of sense. So then this work can, I mean, there's certain formal things that I think repeat from the other work, and, and we had talked yesterday, it's kind of what's not happening, and what's not happening is this black veil, you know, the final kind of isn't going on, but you also see the repetition of certain sources, the kind of infinity, the, the dual circles, but then the introduction of, I mean, I haven't seen work on canvas before. That seems very new for you, and to really more overtly engage painting than sure. you had before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's exciting. I mean, I, I, I'm feeling kind of nostalgic. I mean, I also, you know, I'm attracted to like Danish modern or Baroque and Rococo objects. You'll see those in my studio, and then 
you know, I, just being kind of really kind of looking at Morris Lewis and just seeing all that linen, all that beautiful material, kind of, it's kind of of a time, of an era, perhaps, and it's nice to be able to kind of maybe somehow push it, push it a little, a little further as well. And um, this piece here actually was really inspired by a, um, a Canadian photographer. Uh, Kevin, what, what was that fellow's name again? Oh, Rodney Graham. Right. You met him, haven't you? Yeah, Rodney Graham. That's a conversation. Rodney Graham had done this one wonderful uh, image of, um, of, of, of Morris Lewis uh, paint onto a canvas. <laughs> yep. And um, hence it, it inspired this one piece right here. And um, a long story short, there was kind of a phenomenon that was, was um, I guess being photoshopped or it's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not how gravity works, which was basically on this canvas there's like these perfect blobs of paint with these like simple straight lines flowing down the canvas and that's just, it just doesn't work that way. And what's beautiful about this piece here is it actually happened. Um, I didn't know it was going to happen and it just happened and it was just a really happy accident once again. To have those moments occur in one's existence is really quite wonderful. So. And maybe that um, sort of point of ways of working a little bit at your process, which I think we talked a lot about the importance of the studio and being in the studio, but I think one thing for me that struck me about your work is it's very much a formal exploration. And this idea that you don't sketch, this idea that you come out of ceramics, which is like the most hands-on kind of thing. Sure, sure. It's, not it's about, like a little child. Yeah, yeah and little. it's not about found objects. It's about kind of creating something almost from nothing. <laughs> It's, I think I'm, I'm, I'm attracted to, uh, we talked about this before, is the, the in, inductive um, process perhaps, and that's basically when you have inductive and deductive. Deductive is you have a set of rules and you kind of follow them, uh, which is like being a computer. Um, and then the inductive or more, arts. Sure, <laughs> sure, sure, or the inductive process, process where I take a rock and I, you know, smash, smash myself in the head with it, say the rock is hard, and then you kind of learn from that and you go, from there. So it's all about kind of placing one thing next to another and so forth. So the inductive process is really, really important. And there's you know, there's a handful of us kind of engaging in that. I think I think I think uh, somebody who's like really doing some really awesome stuff right now is Doug. Doug Seema, he's doing some really inspiring things. And, uh, and I think he's very much a part of that that way of working as well. It's just you know trying one thing and then that leads to another and so on and so forth. How many things get thrown away? How many things fail and how many dead things... Dead ends? There's, yeah. a lot of, there's always dead ends. There's like a, a dead end daily. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. I think that's that's necessary. I think that's wonderful. I love it. I love the, 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 that kind of process. And I live in my studio too, so I'm like you know, forced to kind of uh, face it every day. Yeah. Which can be nice and great, you know, but also kind of real drag sometimes. <laughs> but, um, and that kind of formal experimentation. I mean, it, it seems almost as if in some ways you develop a particular language, you use it for a body of work, and then you move on. Yeah, and yeah. So I mean, I, 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 being engaged in ceramics, I just I, was, I did the same thing. I, I did every kind of process that you. I mean, I know how to throw, I can slip cast, I can hand build. It's just like it's all that kind of physical process, that te technique. So um, almost a, 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 an art installer, or art handler. So I get to just, you know I get. I get to have this kind of like uh, postgraduate school experience where you're exposed to all these other ways of working and kind of seeing things and it's like, wow, I need to try that, I need to figure that out. And of course I have a handful of friends that, that have access to like some great tools so then I can go ahead and do that myself. Like for example, just recently, um, I think the beyond these canvas pieces in the back there, there's some a steam bent, some wood uh, pieces, which I had a great conversation with, with Richard um, too long ago. Uh, and my friend Marcos Charles, who is back here, he uh, lent me his steamer, so I had the opportunity just to kind of go for it. I don't know, for me, I think it's really necessary to allow myself. It's a formally, but it also, it seems also very rooted in the formal, the hands on, the Absolutely. fact that the process based always. Absolutely. Absolutely. Will you go back to Serena? I do want to go back. I want to do a, a residency at the Kohler, mm. which is in um, Sheboygan, Wisconsin. It's the toilet factory. It's great. They have access to mm -hmm. to ceramics and iron pouring, so that's that's nice on that list. Really? Mm -hmm. So you're going to move away from campus? Oh no, absolutely not. I mean, I, I like this idea of being able to be kind of flexible and, and 
do what I choose to do. And do you find that you circle back? I mean, that's kind if of continuity. If I have continuity, the opportunity, absolutely. Yeah, so it seems to make sense at the time. A lot of it, I think, has to do just like budgets. It's like if I got money, I'll do whatever I want. And if I don't, then I, you know, find two tables that were thrown out of a strip club, and then you make something out of that. Right. Yeah. And how much of found objects kind of influence? I mean, I know the works that are, for instance, at the museum right now are both kind of derived from, as you said, objects that suggest that you found, that suggest mm -hmm. themselves into mm -hmm. these forms. And I wonder, but with these works, they, you know, I think there's a found object popping up that canvas, but they seem to be very much original form. I think a lot of that has to, has to do, once again, with this kind of process or notion of chance. If it, it's there at the right time, at the right place, it, it gets used. I mean, I've got some stuff in my studio that I've been kind of carrying around for like, Years. And then you know, once a year, twice a year, I have to do this kind of like purging of stuff. And some things stay, some things go. And what um, the shift? I mean, we talked a lot about the psychological state and kind of you feel happier and you're making kind of more happier friendly work. work. I guess if that's a kind of very facile way of saying it, but I think in some ways there is a lightness and a kind of playfulness to this. I mean, even, and I wonder. In terms of title, the show based on that other work and how it seems like language plays a big part of what you do. And if you've called each body of work by a name, and sure, have, sure. So I wonder about this kind of direction and how that functions linguistically and in terms of moving forward. Well, the language I find very interesting in the sense where sometimes Aisha's words are difficult to understand. It's like something you have to read like three or four times just to kind of even get a notion of where she's trying to go or where she's going. Just, they're kind of maybe perhaps kind of something that's a little bit more on the philosophical side, perhaps. So it's, uh, it's, it's asking the, the, the person that's viewing the, the, the text, or consuming the text at that moment in time, to, to maybe th think or, 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 or reflect somehow deeper. So it's like this thing that, that exists on the outside and then it has to be brought in inward. And then also there's that kind of play with some of the, the cutout text that's down on cantos and illuminations and even love like the universe. And even the, the vinyl that's on the wall, it's it's simple, you know, Helvetic text that's just been <coughs> reflected, and then you have to read it in a vertical um, uh, positioning, which is like you, you you only do that in a couple of places. Like for example, when you're driving down the road, that's the only time when you read from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. There's only a handful of places where I actually do that in English language. So what happens with this text? I find it's it's to be deciphered. It almost looks like it's like, like a highly highly uh, sorry. So I like I like the abstraction of something that's really kind of common, like Helvetica, for example. I mean, it's to me I find that really kind of wonderful, and it and it kind of then that that kind of will swing into this idea of just like the idea of a reflective surface, and that goes into another idea of something that I like to follow or think about a lot when I'm making my work is uh, um, uh, the myth of echo and narcissus. And that's something that's been with me for a really long time. I mean, I think since graduate school, which was like 2001, um, I've really kind of latched on to this, this myth of echo and narcissus. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with echo and narcissus, where uh, narcissus is, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, um, or not. Um, Narcissus was you know, this, um, this being that fell in love with his own reflection, and this, that's all he did was gaze into himself. And then you have Echo, who was a bit of a troublemaking wood nymph that had her voice kind of removed by uh, this more powerful goddess. Um, that's one thing I love about Greek mythology, it's so real. Um, you just look at all the characters and you can find them in your life some way, shape, or form. Uh, but regardless, uh, I think it was Hera that took her ability to speak. Um, and all, all, she, which, all she was able to do at that point was to uh, use the words that were uh, spoken to her. So um, I took, I'm fascinated with that because I think that happens quite regularly. And then I come, come across this wonderful quote by, by uh, Philip K. Dick. And it, he says something to the effect that, um, those who control the words control those who have to use them. So words for me are really kind of interesting in that sense. I mean, we always have to kind of use them to kind of communicate with others. Or not, you can use hand gestures or make drawings or 
in this case, make sculpture or, or paintings, what have you. So there's always this opportunity to communicate or, 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 or attempt to communicate, or perhaps take on the narcissist role and um, just gaze into yourself, which I'm sure we all find ourselves doing in some moment in time. It seems like your work seems to do both, right? It's very introspective, and you're very much speaking from the personal and, and a very kind of subjective position about your own thing. But then one of the words that came up is this idea of a social profit. Like uh, we're talking about um, Dawkins. Yeah, I just saw it recently. I don't know if, uh, if anybody else went to that Richard Dawkins. Carrie, <laughs> <laughs> she took me there. That was awesome. Thank you so much for that ticket. It was wonderful seeing him speak live. But what was wonderful was um, at the end of his uh, his lecture, which was wonderful, um, he was asked about some sort of, you know, social, you know, is this going to change, or you know, how are, how are things moving? And he just kind of flat out said, "I'm not a social prophet, and uh, I'll, I'll take on on that role of not being one either." But you know, I mean, who's to say? It'd be nice to influence a mass in one direction or another, but I don't think I can I can sway anybody at this point. Um, well, I think your your use of language sometimes for me this this book it takes on almost <coughs> aesthetic or religious. I mean, you've said you're an atheist, but I think it takes on a certain religious. Sure, sure. Energy, it can, it can be pre it can be preachy. I, yeah. I or know. yeah, or just kind of very bold language, and very bold big ideas. Okay. Language is a really weird thing. One thing that I have to really struggle with every day is is hearing people say, "Oh my God," and uh, it just. It, I'm not even so sure people recognize what they're saying most of the time. I find it really bizarre. I mean, I find myself cursing at the wrong moments of time, and that gets me in trouble, but you know, apparently that matters, but the other doesn't. I'm not exactly sure. And does the language influence the process-based kind of work? Or? It seems to come after. Mm -hmm. Like, the, the, the titling of the pieces come after, it seems. You know, it's just, it's, it's, I'll read something, and it's like, that, that, that's fitting. Uh, not often do they come first. The title of the show comes first, usually. <coughs> it's just a, a process of, 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 once again, just kind of gazing at something, mm -hmm. kind of feeling it. And then, of course, no, there's two, two options for, for love like the universe. It was love like the universe and then um, an infinite mind of love and hate. And uh, we, Anthony and I, chose love, love like the universe. Mm -hmm. Of course, an infinite mind of, of love and hate might come, come later. So. Yeah. Maybe Keep it during a darker that, so period, yeah, perhaps, yeah, you know. yeah. yeah. And the kind of last thing that I, because I wanted to open it up, but also, I mean, I was kind of curious about this, the use of the green light in that mm -hmm. gallery. And I think one thing about your practice is it's very object-based. And you make things, and those things are discrete objects. And I was kind of interested in this more environmental kind of approach or decision to kind of influence the space. And you also have the couch downstairs, sure. which I think starts to veer a little bit outside of of your practice in this kind of tight, formal way and suggest other avenues, spatial design, social? Well, the couch was kind of an accident. It, is, um, it just happened. And uh, it is a portrait of Hugo Montoya. And it's titled, uh, less, <laughs> <laughs> it's titled less, less, less Boring, More Loving, A Portrait of Hugo Montoya. He was using a lot of fur lately. And I just, like I said, I have, I have, to, I have to you know, pay homage and, to those that inspire. So um, there's a longer story behind that piece, but I'll just let that one go. Um, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, this piece here is, it was just an opportunity. Um, I saw when this, when, when Anthony first, you know, saw this space come together, we put that, you know, that light in there, that fluorescent light. And I find it very interesting how, how uh, the market shifts in terms of, you know, uh, from, from what a gallery space should look like and so on and so forth. I, I, I found that that, uh, that rectangle was a really nice opportunity just really to just title it. And I, I kind of knew what the title was going to be. And it's, uh, it stemmed from, from um, a Noam Chomsky um, writing. I'm pretty sure, I mean, I should have pretty much said that that's where it was from. And uh, I think Noam Chomsky's uh, words were, uh, was it, uh, Brain something, sleep something, right? And I'm totally having a total absolute brain for it, and it should have. Um, Colorless green ideas. Sleep, sleep fear. fear asleep. There you go. That's the Noam Chomsky. Thank you, Brooke. Um, and then the, uh, the, the 
the Aisha Rose, uh, I guess, uh, response to that is, uh, uh, green ignorance reigns blissfully. Mm -hmm. So it was just an opportunity just to use that. that was it. I'm not to inspire that word. Yeah. Is that something? I've got a record player downstairs, which also you know starts to become more interactive. As a work downstairs where you can um, select your own soundtrack. <laughs> yes, there's three records. Unfortunately, one's not present, and I'm, I'm not so sure it will be for the whole exhibition. Uh, I've been kind of jerked around by this guy that's shipping with the album. But there's three albums downstairs. Um, <laughs> it's um, <Those> are real. <coughs> is that's is real is uh, well. First and foremost, that piece downstairs is, is really quite beautiful. It was totally inspired by Space Odyssey 2001, and uh, it's kind of my ode to the dawn of man, the monolith. And so I found this opportunity to kind of like, you know, disseminate some sort of like wave algorithmic kind of pulses to the mass that goes to see it. Uh, and hopefully they'll have some sort of like uh, stronger intelligence or better or some, I don't know, influence in some way, shape, or form. So I thought what would be what would be good? I mean, Lenny Bruce was on the list for a long time, and I thought it was just too direct, and so I wanted something a little bit more musical. So I chose uh, also Sprock Zarustra by Richard Strauss, which I think has a lot of kind of push behind it already in terms of its own context of, of, of the book itself, and then also uh, the music, how it falls into place. Uh, and then The Stooges, simply because I was hoping that maybe Iggy Pop would come to the show. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, just to meet him. and then, uh, then you have, then you have uh, the, the album that's not present is, is Black Sabbath's Master Master of Reality. So I thought that that would be three pretty strong albums for for you know, some sort of moment of influence in some way. Yeah, yeah, it's just kind of like these invisible pulses out of the So. Yeah. Do you want to ask the audience? Yeah, yeah. Let's open it. Let's open it. I have a question. Okay. Uh, Let's hear it. No, and love like the universe. Is the universe like a cruel place? Or like is like love like the universe like oh like the universe sucks or is love like the universe like the universe is for forgiving? I'd like to know what you want me to tell you. <laughs> I think it's 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 it's, 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 it's completely. It's, I know that. It's, it's, no, it's a good question because are you the love like the universe? Because the universe really doesn't not. give a shit about or you or anybody in the world. Oh, but take a potato. Right. Exactly. <laughs> no, but it's Sharia Sharia. Yeah, yeah. Shiva Shiva Shiva. I think I I like the fact that. That, that kind of comes up because it does. I've, I've asked a lot of people, it's like, okay, what the fuck does love like the universe be? And I think that's just it. I think, you know, it's, you, 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 you have one planet, you know, people, you're hurling towards another, and it doesn't really matter what's on the surface of that thing. It's going to collide and something will occur. Right now, uh, we are all human. I hope there's no, you know, disguised green lizards in here. Um, but apparently, love is important in this, in this, on the surface of this globe, you know, hurling through space at who knows what. I think it's 100 and 1,200 and some odd miles per hour. It's something ridiculous. Um, but once you start kind of pulling away from, you know, your own consciousness, there's all these other things that occur and around you and. I feel, for the most part, not a lot of people. Not a lot of people are aware of it. They have the belief systems that are in place, which I don't often agree with, which is fine. Um, you know, everybody apparently has free will. Um, I don't know. It's so dark so, over there. Yeah, you can't, don't, don't let me go there. <laughs> Somebody tell me what But that the is, show has a certain binary to it, right? The show is this kind of uh, cruelty and kind of. I mean, we talked about hope, and you talked sure. about kind of wanting to remove that. But there's a certain that idea of light is that idea of open experimentation that downstairs seems kind of over. I mean, a black Sabbath album is a black Sabbath album, you know, and, and that's not appearing. So I think maybe in some ways there's a kind of play against both of those ideas, or what it means to be loved. I mean, I always, I always, when you use it, love like the universe, it's like more than you can have. It's more than everything. 
But it's fine. I, one, one thing I find very interesting is that I think a lot of people kind of remove themselves from it. They think they're not necessarily part of it. And I guess that's, that's really the quandary. It's like, well, what's your take on it? You know? I mean, where do you lie in this notion of love like the universe? I mean, I don't know. It's really, it's, it's really something I, I would like to think, something to contemplate. So it's something I think that, that happens quite regularly within my own consciousness, with my own conscious being, whatever that is. And then the greatest, um, I guess, uh, light or darkness might potentially be that moment that this conscious or this existence ends. I mean, the, you know, the, no the notion of death hasn't been brought up, but that's something that exists in the world quite regularly, too. I mean, it's just thinking of existence and consciousness, I don't know. That's a, just a massive dialogue, and I'm not so sure I should get into any of that right now. Well, I mean, Unless, you know, somebody wants to go for it, I mean, I'll ask that question. Bonfire, whiskey? Yeah, that, that would work too. But, um, yeah, love like the universe. I mean, I think the initial, the initial thought would be like, it doesn't really exist in the universe, but then you think to yourself, well, you're a human, you're a human, it exists now. I don't know how long it will be around for, though. But I think of it very much as infinite. Right? Love like the universe has a certain I'm totally to down for that kind of concept of infinity. I mean, those are the only tattoos yeah, that I have. Yeah, and they come up, it seems to come up in your, mm -hmm. in your work as a symbol, notions of infinity. I, so I also wondered about that kind of like, cosmic exploration. Sure, sure, sure. I think it could be the, that opportunity where I, as a artist, can uh, take the liberty to contradict myself. Where uh, That's, I think, maybe where my hope lies, where my faith lies, <laughs> my belief system lies, is that that all that is happening now somehow will just keep on keeping on some way, shape, or form. That's just an easy way to put it. I guess. That's unpolite, I think. Hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> not one. Yeah. Okay. It's great. I think that's great. Does anybody else have any questions? I really thank you all. What's that one called? This one? <laughs> Launch thy dreadnought of consciousness. <laughs> What's the, what's the plan after the show that is using the huge floor that Emmett suggested? Oh, I can't wait to address that. I'm looking uh, forward to seeing how I can keep it. Is the museum, uh, I mean, it would make sense that it would just sort of stay. It's either that I hope someone buys it and they just have to keep it. I don't know, one or the other. <laughs> well, it's, the, it's, it's the History Museum will be adapting. It's funny because people ask that a lot at the museum. And I haven't really I can imagine you would slip a pallet under it and it's not fitting through any doorways. It's a big my garage door. Yeah, you could break it down. Well, well, you should yeah. pour resin over the old man, the whole fucking thing. What about the library <laughs> patrons? <laughs> More good. Yeah, no, we we have been kind of starting to think a little bit about that, and it's also a question of whether that work would be recreated if somebody if if the work lived on. You know, oh, to be able to do that would be like a jawbreaker. I mean, like, imagine if I had the opportunity to do that, like, you know, 30, 40, 50 times. This right. thing would just be a massive lump. So it could be constantly Madness. evolving. Well, which is really nice too, because if that would occur, then it would it would kind of exist the way this book is going to exist, which is it's going to be kind of printed. I mean, it's already in its third edition, so it's like every month it gets thicker. Oh, and are you translating the Aisha texts from Croatian to English? Yes. And then are you sending this stuff, like the translations back to verify their... She has access to my account, so she actually can like kind of like uh, be a voyeur oh, yeah. this is happening. So she's real? Yes. <laughs> if you go to Croatia, you, so. if you go to Croatia, you can meet her. That one, but if she speaks English, English, I mean, she's, well, she's, she's not speaking. very well. So she can't really tell if, her, if your translations are accurate. Or They're not necessarily direct translations. Okay. That's where the collaborative. It's a conduit. Exactly. It's the, it's the, I'm the conduit. Okay. I would like to see them in the Croatian and then the translation next to I am working on that, actually. I'm thinking that there should be a, like, her. I'm sure it's a beautiful sounding language. Yes. Oh shit, gorgeous. It's not <laughs> <laughs> On that note, guys, thank you for all.